Priscilla Stadler from LaGuardia Community College. I'm the Associate Director of Instructional Design with the Center for Teaching and Learning, and I am thrilled to be part of the CTL's Council and um, planning this retreat today. Um, we are going to hear more from our two in-person speakers and one um, virtual speaker via video about accessibility support structures and inclusive learning design practices that are being addressed throughout the university. As programs and initiatives are implemented throughout CUNY, it's crucial to listen to our students. So I'm very happy that um, one of our in-person speakers and one of our speakers who couldn't be here in person um, is going to be here with us by video and they are both students bringing their perspective to this important discussion today. Barbara Bookman directs CUNY's Disability Services and CUNY Leads, which prepares students with disabilities for employment, as well as Project Reach for students on the autism spectrum. And she's also directing a new program called CUNY Unlimited for students with intellectual disabilities. And our other speaker in person today um, is one of our five student leaders from LaGuardia's Designing for All project, Perla Lopez. She's been able to use the challenges that she's confronted to grow her strength, wisdom, and compassion, and in turn, help her fellow students. And um, just as a little preface to our video participant, Christian, he's also one of the five student leaders from LaGuardia's Designing for All project. And he wasn't able to be here in person today, but um, we're happy to be able to share some of his observations and experiences with you through his video, which you'll see after we hear from Barbara and Perla. So welcome. Hi, thank you, and it's really great to be here to share um, some information about disability resources and supports at the university for everybody. So I just do want to say that, as you see on the startup piece, it was myself and Ray Cosberg who was going to talk a little bit more at the campus level and about some of the challenges, but unfortunately he had a family emergency so I'm gonna to try to be Barbara and Ray a little bit, I'll do my best. But um, in a way, it's good because it will give Perla more time and I think we all really like hearing from students even more better than us. So, so in a way, we're happy about this. So first of all, um, I assume everybody has had some contact with disability services on their campus, more or less. So I want to do just a quick overall, you know, 101, what, what's going on, where we are, where we're going, and just briefly a couple of real quick fast facts that about 20% of all students with disabilities in New York State are educated at CUNY. So we really have, you know, of, of the students that go to college, so we really have a large population that we're working with. Um, neurodiversity at CUNY, which is our autism spectrum, and uh, certain learning issues and, and other um, neuro issues has gone up by over 150%, so that's one of our <coughs> fastest growing populations. And I must say, what we see now in the offices is that I would say a vast majority of our disabilities are invisible, which also leads us to say that we believe, and we don't really know for sure, that there's probably two people for every one that has disclosed. So whatever our numbers are, it could be really 3,000, you know, triple that. Um, we have produced, you know, students with disabilities are in every walk of life, every major, every campus. We've had a valedictorian and salutatorians. We have selected student officials. We have athletes. So really, students with disabilities, I'd say, run the bell curve of all students. We are basically everywhere. We started a program, which I'm going to talk about, 10 years ago, CUNY Leads, which is celebrating its 10th anniversary soon. 
And Project REACH, which is our program for autism, was highlighted in Huffington Post as a very successful program. So we're proud to you know, have that as a CUNY launch program. And we are going to enhance our CUNY LEADS program. So at COSA, as we were saying, 10,000 students, that's what we know of, and that's who we proudly serve in our campuses across, across the university. Um, on the autism spectrum, we have over 600 students that we know of, and that's the last count. We don't know, we don't have the um, new spring count, but it's been growing every semester. And we, we, you know, that presents issues in terms of classroom, in terms of universal design, in terms of sometimes behavioral issues, and these are things that we like to try to focus on support for our students and especially for the faculty. Um, every, you know, every campus has the disability service, which arranges the accommodations, which can be testing arrangements, note takers, assistive technology, sign language interpreters, counseling, priority, and a variety of other things. It's important to note that um, when students come to the college, we've had times, and I'm a former campus um, disability director before Ben stepped into Queensboro and kicked it up a notch when I left Queensboro. Um, uh, many, sometimes students will go right to the professor and say, oh, I get time, I get this, I get that. Accommodations always need to be arranged directly by the, by the disability director. Never the professor, if the professor has questions with them, if anyone has questions, please go back to the disability director. Don't, don't argue with the student, don't let the student argue with you, right back to the professor. Um, you know, clearly uh, students need to understand that in college, We've got to um, be more reactive. Students have to disclose. We cannot go up and say, I think you have a disability, or I know you have a disability. It's something that students need to disclose. OK. So again, for the faculty, again, as I just said earlier, go to the director. Um, Assistive technology is really growing tremendously on the campuses, and that's really, I keep saying that's the moving target, and it's so good to hear about all of the initiatives that are going on. Um, Carlos just handed me from CATS, which is going to talk about a lab package that if anybody should need, anybody can get. There's Zoom text, Open Book, Win. There, there's a lot through CATS that you can just get for the asking. Okay, so we have information on that. Uh, we can encourage people enough on campuses. There are still professors that don't have disability statements on their syllabus, and we really would encourage everybody because that's, you know, one of the biggest problems that I've always found, and I think many people can, you know, attest to, is sometimes a student will come in, maybe they've done special ed, maybe they've done resource room, they go to college and say, I don't want to do that anymore, I did all of that. They try to go the regular route, they, they have a problem, or they don't know about disability services. So if it's on the syllabus, then um, at least there's an awareness. Anybody for faculty, CUNY Assistive Technology Services, it's on the website, they, they have a variety of things. And I think uh, Patricia maybe is gonna talk a little bit about that, no? Oh, okay, well you're gonna talk about tech, I saw technology, okay. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the signature initiatives that are on the campuses. I want to talk about CUNY Leads, Project Reach, and about our CUNY Unlimited. So CUNY Leads is a program that was started again 10 years ago. It's linking employment, academics, and disability services. The reason it started is as disability directors, we were meeting every month at our um, you know, monthly council meetings, and we said we work so closely with, with the academics, with the professors, with the students to get them through college. What they're missing a lot of times were the employability skills, the experiences. Sometimes students with disabilities would come to us, maybe they didn't do summer employment, they didn't, they didn't have part-time jobs, they didn't have that focus. So what we really felt were students needed to be brought up to, you know, peer with, with their other students and get these experience and have successful employment outcomes. You know, we say it's part of retention. It's part of the outcome. 
we, we want, you know, we're all here to educate our students, to prepare our students, but if the graduation day is kind of the beginning of the end, what, where'd we go? You know, what did we do? So we created this program, and after three years of it being a grant, it turned out to be so successful that there were a few years of being patched up month by month because the economy wasn't very good, and then it became a line item. Every campus has a CUNY Leads Advisor, and we hope everybody is aware of it and everybody utilizes it. And the services, again, it, it just prepares students. There's advisement and counseling. It's really keeping your eye going forward. If a student struggles with a course, we'll help, you know, in terms of balancing what you need, where are you going, um, working with internships, working with employers. It's really just self-advocacy, preparing students to go forward. And all we ask the student to do, and, and please, and every, we hope all faculty knows, just get a student to the, to the, it's either the accessibility office, the disability office, in a few cases, career services, the CUNY Leads Advisor is on your campus. I mentioned autism, all right. The, the statistics are really approximately one in 68, we say, are diagnosed with autism. There are so many students we have here that come otherwise diagnosed. It may not be autism, it may be some other diagnosis, or it may be no diagnosis, it may be a psychiatric diagnosis. But this is a growing population. And one of the issues we so, so often find, even in a first disclosure, is they end up in a behavior situation. And you get a call from the dean's office, <coughs> the behavior intervention team, or they had a meltdown in class. So, one of the things that we're trying to work on also is providing and working together for universal design, you know, some UDL things to really help faculty to understand how to deal with some of these issues, how to really avoid some of, some of these behaviors that happen. And what we, well, this is just the, the prevalence, again, one in 68. There are some studies that say it's as low as like one in 48, but those are you know, being debated, but that seems to be the number that we see. Just taking a look at what we're seeing at CUNY from 2012 when we started Project REACH to serve this population, we've gone from, if you look, from 229 to, well, 589, now it's over 600 with just a constant upward curve of growth. So this is, we expect to see more and more and more of these students at the university. <coughs> so Project REACH has five campuses that are um, pilot project programs. They are a resource. We would ask anybody with a question, an issue on autism, to reach out to the Project REACH campus, which would be at Kingsborough, Staten Island, LaGuardia, Brooklyn, and BMCC. This is all online as well, where there are pilot programs where we've been designing supports and resources to be utilized and shared by anywhere. Some of the things we have, we have mentor training programs going on. We have, you know, on one campus they've developed literally because sometimes students on the spectrum are so literal that they, you know, we had a professor say to someone, basically, eyes open, mouth zip, and the student, like, I can't do that. I don't have a zipper. It's not possible. And it became an issue. The mentor working with the student literally created a, um, like a dictionary of basic expressions to get, you know, to help the student and to help the professor. Um, we also have, you know, situations of way to break down deadlines, timelines, work your way backwards, um, just to really bring people together. One of the things we try to work also is just peer support, understanding to avoid bullying and, and deal with, um, again, I mentioned behavior issues. Sometimes we see what looks like stalking, and it turns out really just someone doesn't quite understand how to approach someone. So we, we are working on design to help people and help the faculty, the students, the programs to work with, with some of these things. CUNY Unlimited is something that's new at the university, coming soon, actually, to the university. 
And what that really is, it, it's funny, over the years, and I'd say over maybe a lot of years that I've been with CUNY and in this field, there was a time when learning disability was considered kind of unusual. And I remember people, professors saying to me, really? People who can't read and write, they're coming into our campus? And, and then um, there was a time when some of the psychiatric invisible diseases, like bipolar, was like an issue. And it, it keeps expanding. And then, again, the neurodiversity, you know, talking about the students with autism, there was a time they weren't expected to go to college or they didn't have the opportunity. And now they are, and we're learning how to serve and just making it another piece of our diversity conversation. So what's happening now is there is a national movement for students with intellectual disabilities to rather than go to the kind of <coughs> rehab type programs that they may have gone to workshops of years ago and certain basic training programs, they're able to come into the colleges, sit in classes with a mentor, um, altered um, assessment, alternate assessment, not for credit, uh, but really just learn, have internships, what we find is that when you raise the bar and you raise the expectations, that the outcome is greater. So we are in a five-year grant right now um, with the Department of Education, University of Rochester, and AHRC New York to grow a program at CUNY that we are hoping to see that will be a real um, credential program that students will be able to apply for, maybe get a financial aid, and study at the university. Right now, it's at five campuses, but kind of unofficially through Melissa Riggio, AHRC, and at Queens College, we work with District 75 uh, of, of the Board of Ed. So we are, this is a program we're trying to grow, and as part of our grant, what we've done is we have faculty committees on each of these campuses, and we've been doing universal design. But a lot of times what, it, what we find is when we offer a universal design for faculty, we kind of get, I hate to say, the choir. So it's really good to be here, because we can talk about you know, this universal design and these opportunities and these programs that we're developing across the university and that for all students. You know, I think what we find and what we can all say is the more we use universal design, the better it works for everyone. You know, I often refer to a program we did many, many years ago when I was at Queensboro, where we recorded math classes, and it was called Revisit My Class. And we figured our students with learning disabilities, Ben's laughing, they're not still doing it, are they? Okay. Um, the idea was that students with learning disabilities that struggled with math were able to just go back and revisit the class and see it and, and look at it over and over again. And at the end of the day, when we checked in who was really revisiting it and who used it mostly, it turned out it was our students who English was not their first language, with or without a disability. So you know, we found it was really creating a universal design. And, and that's really our mission overall that, that we're trying to do. So now, since Ray's not here, OK, he was talking about, he was going to mention some of the challenges and looking ahead and some of the things that we're dealing with. And of course, funding has not really changed over the years, but the population has grown and the nature of accommodations have gotten more costly. Um, you know, it's hard to sometimes retrofit programs and policies. I know with technology especially, which is such a moving target now, with captioning, with, with all of the things that we need to do, um, you know, it's always an issue, and he's talking about universal design. I do want to mention the April 6th, the Accessibility Conference that is out there online, and we hope um, people will sign up for it because that is really important like people to go to. So um, I don't know, is, is this a time for Q&A, or do we want, um, We actually if hadn't planned to do Q&A as oh. part of this initial segment, yeah. but I think yes. we have you know, a little bit of time, Before so if, Perla, if we could yes. take like just, if or we could go, go ahead to Perla and then maybe have questions for, for both of you afterwards. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Perla. That. Okay, thank you so much, thank Barbara. You.
Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am really excited to be here. So thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm <laughs> I'm very excited about the project um, because I have been. Um, I don't want to say discriminated against, but I feel like I haven't been supported as much as I needed to. Um, meaning, um, with my first semester, which wasn't at a community, um, I went to a SUNY, SUNY New Pulse, and um, I was doing well because I was on medication, but it was, turns out I had the wrong diagnosis. I was depressed. Uh, I was diagnosed with major depressive disorder, um, and it turns out that I'm actually bipolar. So I was on the wrong meds, and then um, to add to that, I was I ran out of meds mid semester, and because of my withdrawal, I don't remember anything past. I mean, after the Thanksgiving break, so I ended up failing all my classes, and um, I asked for an appeal, and it wasn't granted. I mean, I showed proof that. I had run out of medicine and I was working hard, but it wasn't enough. So it's really important for me to get resources and now I ask for whatever I need as many times as I need, but I know a lot of students or most um, aren't comfortable asking for things. So um, we've been talking about how to help students and making it more accessible um, so that Students don't have to ask for it, so it's available from day one and it's on the syllabus. So, yeah. Any questions? Uh, so, when I had my interview to join the program, I brought all the things that I used to help me. Um, and besides all the support that I've received at LaGuardia, a big part of it has been the way that I've learned to manage my time. So I have like a color-coded calendar and um, I've noticed that I do better in classes where we have set deadlines and whatever we have to do for the week so that I can make it, make my own kind of like timeline. Um, and Professor Battle, who was actually the one who um, invited me to the research project, um, has that kind of syllabus and she has started doing color coded. So I think if we expand that to all professors, then students would benefit from that. Um, and I know sometimes deadlines have to change, but we should be notified as soon as possible so that we know what's going on instead of like, I had this psychology class that I ended up having to withdraw from where we, ha we did have, no, we didn't have a timeline at all. She said, we're gonna have to do this essay, that's 25% of our grade, but I don't know when. And then like a week before it was due, she said, yeah, so we need the essay next week. And she did the same thing with exams. So it was just too overwhelming for me. So I withdrew. And then um, I took the class in the winter session with a great professor who, it was psychology. So he actually had like um, information from his own projects, which was really helpful. And of course he had the deadlines so that I ended up getting an A instead of like the other students that I was in in the other class, the best grade that they got was a B plus. So that would be really helpful. I think also we've been talking about training professors with more like sensibility training so that students aren't, don't feel intimidated to approach professors. Um, and I've noticed that it's more common in like the math department. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to generalize, but every math class I've taken, <laughs> sorry. 
<laughs> every student that I've had that's been like in a math class is like, yeah, I asked for an extended deadline because I went to the hospital and they didn't, like they have proof that they've been to the hospital and they didn't get any help. Or like last Monday I had to miss class because I had to go to the hospital. So I showed up to class on Tuesday, which was my birthday. Um, <laughs> And I asked the professor, I was like, could you like help me out with this program? I mean, problem, I wasn't here. And she was like, well, if, I can't, if you weren't here, I can't help you. Which like would have taken like 10 minutes to run over it with me. Um, so like, can we make that not happen? <laughs> Another thing yesterday in the same class, she, uh, a student kept asking questions and she was like, what is wrong with you? Which, I mean, like, I don't even have to explain it. Um, so we do an upset, need sensibility training. I think we could also take, we, we could learn it out from my department, which is human services, mm -hmm. and obviously <laughs> um, they're very well trained in motivational interviewing, um, and I think our students are more comfortable, I mean they're comfortable with every professor there, um, so that could really help to learn from them and maybe have like a training with the director, um, David Bimby. I think that's where it starts. So if students don't feel intimidated to approach a professor, then they'll be more successful in class. With like this math professor now, I feel like I can't ask for anything. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fred. <laughs> I think before we move to the questions, we'll just see um, Kristen's video, and then we can um, ask questions of Barbara and Hello, my name is Kristen Manaros and I am a student leader here at LaGuardia Community College in the Designing for All project. Okay, so according to my time here at LaGuardia, what has worked well for me, it has been working, having the disability office and the professors work as one in order to have the accommodations that I would need in my classroom or within any sort of classroom and also having the professor put up the work on Blackboard or on any other um, educational website that they would use because that way whenever I'm not um, whenever I'm not sure of the notes I could always refer back to the website where the professor has the notes also what has also worked well for me is having a note taker for every class that way whatever I don't I don't get the note taker will get it for me either way So what has been challenging for me? Well, that's a good question. What has been challenging for me is being organized in the classroom according to the class to the classes that I have. Also, what has been challenging for me is the first day of class. Whenever I get to the classroom, the welcoming of the professors to the to the class. And in which one time I had a bad, bad experience where I went, it was the first day of class, and I wish this, this will never happen to anybody because it, it's really not recommendable for the teachers to do this, even though I don't think they would do it to anybody. But I had this one time where I went to the first day of class and 
I barely walked into the classroom, but a professor didn't even greet me, and she automatically discriminated me by telling me, you're in the wrong classroom, you don't belong here, and when I presented myself to her, I told her, I asked for her name to make sure it was the right professor, which it was, and what I didn't like about her was what she said to me, which was, this is the first time that I'm going to have a student with disability in my classroom, and I don't even think you're even capable of doing the work I'm going to give in here. And she wanted to direct me and send me right back to the registration office and told me, why don't you do yourself a favor, go back to the registration office and try to find yourself a different classroom with a different t-shirt. Because this is the first time that I'm going to have a student with, my dis with a disability in my classroom and I don't even think you're even capable of doing the work I'm going to give in here. So according just to that one experience, it was a bad day and I had to first think whether if I was going to accept that or not because it's a free country where we are all different but also special in our, in our own ways. No. Nobody has a, the, the right to discriminate us because, like I said, this is a free country. And I hope that this never happens to anybody at all. So, recommendations that I would have for LaGuardia or for any other campus would be to always, instead of the students having to go and recommend and request note takers. More likely, why won't why don't why does why not have the office go a step further for every semester and try to have those note takers ready for the students who need note takers as well as any other accommodations that they could give to students because there have been times where I would have to recommend or request a note taker and it will take almost up to a month in order for them to find me either a permanent note taker for that semester or there will be times where the note taker won't show up and I will miss out on the class notes that I would need for the next day. So it would be better if the um, if the people in charge would go a, would take a step further and accommodate these note takers ahead of time. That way when the class time get arrives the students won't have to lack won't have to miss out on the lack of notes due to the disability. For the professors, in order to make the learning environment more capable and more welcome for students with disabilities, is don't be surprised if you have a student with a disability in your, in your class. Because we are all different in, our, in, every, in each way. So, Let's make sure, or I would request if the professors could always be ready for anything unexpected to happen within the first day of class. Also, if it's possible to always have the notes available in, in print or in any special way in order for the student to be capable of reading it, and having it in hand. Uh, if anyone has questions for Barbara or Perla.
question, uh, and I'll, it's more addressed to the room. Um, do a lot of you all have uh, faculty orientation uh, sensitivity training for new faculty? I mean, besides just something that would go in the syllabus, but is this part of regular faculty training on your college camp on your campuses? I, I'm not because it should be. I mean, a basic it should be part of uh, orientation for all new faculty. I would think. I'm just. This would be an area that we should definitely be involved in if, if it's not happening on a routine basis. The syllabus is also mandated to be on the, uh, the syllabus statement. There is a policy where everything must have to put it on their own. Yeah, the right. But I would think you would need something more than just a, that, right? I mean, you need, they, they do need more training. The faculty like. accommodation um, book goes out to everybody, and it is on the web. And, you know, it's really very sad in some ways. I mean, you've had, you become self-advocate and you really come a long way, but sometimes you see the lack of sensitivity of a certain thing that could be said just can really have a severe impact. But what we always say is, um, the same like Christian with the notes, I don't understand why there's not a note taker ready because generally accommodations are always done between the director and it's simply a card or a piece of paper handed to the student. The student should not have to disclose the disability to the professor unless the student chooses to. So in other words, you're basically just saying, I need these accommodations, which I'm entitled to, you know, and it's been worked out. Uh, whether the accommodations, say extended time or a separate location, whether that's because somebody has nervous, someone has a weak muscle in their arm, or any other reason is almost irrelevant unless at some point the student chooses. But you see how important it is uh, in, in part of the designs. I mean, to me, I think as we do more with the universal design, I think we really do need to step up some of our sensitivity training across the way. Because there are some professors, I, I don't understand what happened to Christian, and it's very unfortunate. That sounds very completely way off the curve. I mean, in all my years, uh, I have a couple of colleagues who are disability directors here. I'd say we'd all say this is unusual. But we see how important it is for students to really know, like you struggled at New Paltz. That maybe didn't have to happen. How important it is for students to be aware and faculty to be aware. And again, I still say it goes to successful outcome and it goes to retention because you left New, New Paltz. I hope your experience here is going to be great. Uh, but it shows how sometimes the accommodations aren't such a big deal. They're important. It's important to just have an understanding and a sensitivity of what's needed. Can I just follow up on that a little bit? If I may, Barbara, just a follow-up thought on that, which I've learned by being involved um, with the students from Designing for All Project at LaGuardia, and that is that some students are not approved by the Office for Students with Disabilities. And so they're not officially recognized, and yet they are struggling in the classroom for various reasons. So I think that while it's key, of course, everything that um, the disability services can offer for students, there's also many, many students, and as you pointed to, who are not in the numbers, who are not on the chart in any sort of official way. And that's where universal design for learning and inclusive learning practices are key because it's a different way for some faculty to think about who's coming into their room and who the students really are and what that means in terms of, of their practice as educators. Um, so I don't, I feel like he would disclose this, but Christian's experience was also in the math class. <laughs> um, but I would, I would also like to share that I have been a note taker for the program uh, with the program for deaf students. Um, and I think it's a great idea to have a note taker in every class. Um, and also, I think it would also be a great idea to have like a way for students to redeem their points by having a participation online because there are a lot of students who are too nervous to answer questions. Um, so I think we could also 
post the questions on Blackboard and then they have a chance to answer them too. I've also heard, um, I actually visited New Paltz a few weeks ago, um, and a few students shared that their classroom had like clickers so that they could like pick the answer without having to speak up. Um, so I think, I mean, I don't know if it's uh, realistic, but something similar to that would also be really helpful. Uh, sure. My name is Kate Wolf. I teach at Hostos Community College, and um, I don't remember the sensitivity training in our new faculty orientation when I went through it. But also, I think we have to consider how do we train an, an adjunct faculty because we have huge numbers of adjunct faculty, uh, so part-time faculty, um, and how do we make sure they get the sensitivity training that is needed? Uh, I'm not saying that they would be less sensitive. I'm just saying. We need to reach out to all faculty. And senior faculty, faculty, too, because mm -hmm. yes. you know, they know everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing new. You know, I mean, but yeah. how do you reach all segments right. of, your, of your faculty? Right, that's important. Really good points. Um, thank you all so much. I see that there's, there. Or is it a really quick question? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to ask it so we can at least just plant it in the room? But we do need to move on. Sure. It's kind of a response to Perla's comment about clickers. Um, there are a lot of them are organized around kind of passive classrooms, right? Lectures and note taking. But what we're trying to do is get our faculty to be doing more active learning, flip classrooms, that kind of stuff. So it's sort of a question about what kind of accommodations are available and what kind of creativity is available on the disability services side for supporting mm -hmm. students with disabilities in these classrooms that may require more kinds of active engagement. Question mark. Fantastic question. Our ideas with each other, which is one of the main points of, the, of this day. So thank you for asking that. Um, as much as I hate to move along, I'm happy to welcome the next group in a couple of minutes. And just want to thank you both, Perla and Barbara, for joining us today.